you ready? Hello, and welcome to the Whole House Podcast, where you can find home, health, and family all in one place. Our team is comprised of moms from different upbringings and backgrounds, and we each have different passions and giftings and strengths. We each represent a different room, and we all make up the whole house. So grab a cup of coffee and join our overly caffeinated ladies here for the Whole House Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Whole House Podcast. Today, it's Kathleen, and I have a couple special guests who were part of my pre-read team for the novel Defining Home. We have Rebecca Schoonover. Say hi, Rebecca. Hello. And Alec Cohen. Say hi. Hello. So these two teens, you can say your ages. How old are you, Rebecca? Well, when I first read the book, I was 16, but now I'm 17. Okay. Alec? My age is unknown to history, but I identify as an 18-year-old. All right. I'm so glad you identify as an 18-year-old today. And so these... Two were on my pre-read team, and they were also on the review team of this book, and they were a lot of help, and they got to be in meetings and tell me what to do, and sometimes I did it, and sometimes I didn't. <laughs> Nothing I said like, was done. Don't kill that person. <laughs> so um, I invited them here just so we could talk a little bit about the book. It's been out for a little while, and the sequel is going to be releasing in September, And I wanted to just sit down with them before the sequel releases. In case you haven't read Defining Home, it's a novel. And we're going to just talk through some things. The novel is set in Poland. And it's set in an orphanage in a small village called Sileyuv outside of... Outside of... um, yeah, Piotrko. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, wait, I can't think of anything right I can't now. Pronounce it anyway. And they're all worried that they're going to mess up. So I already messed up. So now you can feel better. If you mess up, it's fine. Sure. It's yeah. So, and um, the main character is named Adelina, and she's a 15 year old girl in the orphanage. So I'm just going to ask you each to take a turn. What did you think about the main character, Adelina? You want to go first or me? Ladies first. All right. Such a gentleman. Um, she was a, you know, your she was an oddball in um, Poland. She looked different. She acted different. Everybody in Poland is known for you know, blonde hair. She has this bright curly red hair. So I really liked how you set her up to actually even look different. Oh, like, okay. It's like you kind of follow that stereotype. Like, oh, main character's like. Has blue hair and a sea of blondes, you know. Right. I but I really liked it. Good. Anything else about her? Uh, I may come to mind something. All else, right. If you think of something, just say it. Uh, personally, to me, um, <clears throat> my thoughts on Adelina were just. I was very. I, okay. I enjoy reading books where the protagonist is not a paragon, which is, you know, this perfect shining image of a human being, so like Captain America. True. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she has her flaws, like through her selfishness and stuff, and isn't completely perfect makes the character a lot more relatable, a lot more, like, closer to home, because no one here is perfect except maybe Kathleen, but (laughs) that's on her good days. (laughs) She's Saint Kathleen. So, you know, let's let's look at the setting a little bit. I told you where it takes place, but what exactly is happening in Adelina's life at this at the opening of the book? Well, she's um going to go meet her possible adoption family, mm-hmm. but then, you know, things the ship tips sideways and everything just goes chaotic and explodes and she's Trying to put stuff back together without letting it crumple. It, it's like trying to hold water, and the water's seeping out through your fingers, but you're still trying to hold it together. Right, right. and yeah, and the thing is, like, you, when you're reading the first chapter, it's not like, here's this perfect setting that's like, boom, things are falling apart right away. Right. And do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think she sums it up pretty well. She's... Really, the beginning is just her worrying about what her new adoptive parents will think of her as a first impression. Right. You didn't even, like, lead us up. It was just first chapter, boom, boom. 
get you in there. That's so, what life is. Boom. Tell me about Daria. Who's Daria? Daria is her um, best friend that she... I didn't really give us information if she grew up with her. Maybe they came to this orphanage at the same time. My memory's not coming to me if that's so, but they were both being adopted at the same time, but something happened to Daria that um, caused, you know, the plot twist. Right, because Daria's adoption failed, and you're right. They both did grow up in the orphanage together, and they had this dream of being adopted. And so here they are, teenagers, and they're finally getting that chance, and... Daria's adoption fails. So, but what what motivated Adelina? I'll let you take this one. Uh, her main motivations throughout this book, especially, well, towards the beginning more so, her motivations are um, just making sure that she gets adopted because she's tired of the orphanage. I imagine if I was stuck in an orphanage, I probably would be tired of it too. But she, her motivation was really to find a family and to follow her dreams, which was to be an artist. Right. And there was a specific place she wanted to go. New York. It's a heck of a town. (laughs) 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 To quote the Skylar sisters, it is the greatest city in the world. Okay. New York. Yes. No Since we're all going to sing, that's where she wanted to go. I could have sang it. And so, she, so what was her reaction when her um, prospective adoptive parents said, we live in West Virginia? Where? <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm pretty sure that's like something that stood out to me is she was like, where? That, wait, wait, that state exists? <laughs> Which is most people's reaction to hearing West Virginia. Do you mean Western Virginia? No, no, West Virginia is a state. Right, oh, go and say, I have friends in Richmond. Do you know them? Two different yeah, states. Like meeting other people in the fall festival um, up there at um, Elkins. My dad's from Elkins, and we go try to go there every year. And hearing other people from out of state, they're like, oh, we just love it here. I'm like, you do? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the people. It's, like, it's so beautiful here. It is. I mean, it is. <laughs> it depends on the lighting, mostly. <laughs> Uh, no, this place is pretty. It's gorgeous here. I've lived in lots and lots and lots of states, and I love West Virginia. Okay, so what was her greatest longing, and how did that change? I mean, you, well, we kind of said that already, but, like, her greatest longing was to go to an art school in New York, because no one ever thinks that through. But her greatest <laughs> longing was to be an art student in New York, and to, to be in New York, and make right. it big as an artist. And it changed very, very quickly when she found out her prospective adoptive parents were from West Virginia, and which is a good three, four, five hours away from West right. from New York. It's a lot. I have, I have family up in New York. It's like a 16-hour drive. It's a <laughs> lot. It depends on where in New York, but it's a lot. It's just a lot. So, and you know, I don't want to give away too much about the book, but of course we have to tell you a little bit just so... You'll want to read it, but there's a plot twist right after she meets her prospective parents and and what happened. Someone mm. to her best friend. You need a little cueing. They were they had to go back and reread some stuff yesterday. We were all like, wait, we got to read the book again. Kidnapping. Oh, you said the word. Oh wait. <laughs> it was basically kidnapping, luring, kidnap. No, well. I want to say that at the beginning it was more of a lure into kidnapping yes. because she like what happened was she had to pass a mental exam, mm-hmm. um, which the book hits pretty well on what that looks like is like acting out basically a scenario like a real life family scenario like mm-hmm. just like a family in a living room and how that how that goes and everything like that. And she ended up failing the um, mental portion of the exam. So she felt like all hope was lost. And the main villain, do you want me to say his name? Sure. The main villain, uh, Rizard, he offered her a job. Right. In quotations. And she took it because she's, she thought, well, no one's going to want to adopt a 15, 16 year old, uh, 
from an orphanage, so she might as well go and start her own life by herself since she lost hope for ever getting a family. Right, so that she felt like that was her last chance. And just to clarify, we're talking about Daria, the best friend, so that changes the whole whole perspective for Adelina. But let's talk a little bit about the sidekick, Kasha. She is a very... How young was she? Like, she was only a couple years ten? younger, right? She's about nine or ten. Because I, I think she's ten in the second book. And, she, and I'm the writer. Well, I'm like, You're the writer. Yeah, Kathleen. I see like a tiny... Well, she's small for her age. Yeah. I just saw yeah, it. Adorable, little, bouncy, happy, air. Spritey, energetic. if you will. If you will. <laughs> and I do. she... When you read... read her, you know, parts of the book, you can never see, like, she definitely has um, problems focusing from, mm-hmm. you know, like, a tiny Labrador from your running world, wanting to help you, wanting to please. Yes. And what's her tell? What is something that she does all uh, the time? A thing that she constantly does, which really tells you that she has attachment issues, is she always loses, in quotations, Like, I'm pretty sure she hides these objects, let's Mm -hmm. face it. Um, A random object that the orphanage will receive through, like, a church donation or something. But she'll claim it was from her father because she was abandoned. And she she has attachment issues because of that. So she'll hide a random object that she claims her father gave her. And will constantly ask Adelina to help her find it. So that she feels like, hey someone is dependent on me, someone... Right. I'm connected to someone, so, like, they're not completely abandoned. Yes. Exactly. She goes very attached to this said person, like, towards the end of the book. <laughs> you got me really attached to her, like, she was almost got spotted or something, or... And I was like, no, Kathleen, no! <laughs> Please, no, just yes. leave her alone! Right, just leave her alone, let her live a good life. Let someone live a good life. Right, and that's what I mean, these... These guys got to participate in the revision, and so when they were reading it, they're telling me, messaging me. Before the me, revision, oh my goodness. Right, and telling me, you can't do that to her, or don't let this happen to her, or don't let anybody die. We don't want someone to die. Before the revision, everyone you love basically dies. Let's face it. Okay, we, we did revise some of that. I listened to my team. Basically, everyone died before the revision. Okay, but some people live now, so... <laughs> yeah, now! <laughs> See? I needed you guys. When I had to take that break, I was like, Kathleen... <laughs> no! <laughs> yes. I had people yelling at me, because there were other... There were some adults on the revision team, too. Not as many people died as Edgar Allan Poe would kill them off. That's right. But a lot of people died. Right. <laughs> Thank goodness it's revised. <laughs> And speaking of Edgar Allan Poe, Adelina has a coping mechanism. And what is her coping mechanism? Poems. She she will recite poems out of memory to help her cope with stressful situations, uh, situations that might trigger some feelings of neglect or abandonment and all that sort. And she just will start quoting random poems that come to mind or that right. remind her of the situation or, or defining the <laughs> defining the word of what she's feeling like i think at some point she defines the word abandonment or scared or right she defines words yeah. a lot and that's why you know that's where the title came from was defining home because she'll define a word and then lapse into poetry and sometimes it comes out of her mouth I'm a very slow person. I just got that, so this is revelating to me. I was like, (gasps) defining home. Oh, my goodness. That's what that means. That's what the book title means. I opened up the first page. You know what? You can stop. You can stop. You can stop. (laughs) Well, oh, you can open up the first page and see Rebecca's review right there on the the very first page. And on the back. No, no. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, moving on. Um... We've kind of already talked about this, but we need to just say it outright. What is the theme of the book? Sex trafficking. Okay. It's human trafficking, and it is a combination of what goes on uh, behind the scenes of, like, orphanages and orphans, and the risks of 
how often orphans can be inducted into human trafficking because, especially the older ones, the ones who might have failed the mental portion of the exam right. and who feel hopeless can be inducted into believing that they have this purpose by going and taking this job when it turns out it's not really a job, they're being sold. Exactly. It's definitely the Eve and the Garden of Eden kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. temptation to the eye. I don't, I want something more, and then once you take it, you realize, oops, but oops is yeah. too far oops to go back. <laughs> yeah, because Rizard knows exactly what these girls need or want, and he researches what they're thinking, them. They're yeah, watching. right. So. And that's often the way that human trafficking works is there's a person who befriends a young girl or boy, but in this case it's girls, and finds out all about them before he approaches them. So I don't want to give up too much information, so we'll move on. Um, Reasons I have attachment issues are interesting ones. <laughs> well, and that, I'm going to throw in a question they were not prepared for because one of the reasons I wrote this book was... To raise awareness for teens about how easy anyone can get sucked into a human trafficking issue. And I actually wrote this book because my niece was almost taken at a truck stop because she was, you know, older teen, believe this guy who promised her that he was going to upstart her music career and all they had to do is meet at this truck stop and oh, no. he was going Honey, to take no. her. Yeah, and yes. But Honey. anyway, the, the, the police did come and save her and she realized before it was too late that this was a setup with a lot of phone calls and texts from family members telling her, don't go, don't do this, why did you go to the truck stop with him kind of thing. But it's so easy, especially when somebody has a dream and someone will tell you that that dream can be fulfilled if you only do this. So here's a question that I did not put on your list, but um, what has this made you think about human trafficking? I mean, have you thought about it more? Have is it been, have you are you more aware of? Honestly, I never really. I've entertained the thought, but I never really fully, you know, grasped because it's definitely a subject that it's not comfortable. It doesn't sit right with the soul. Right. It's it's not an easy topic. It's right. rather hard to, and even and when you like maybe write it wrong, say it wrong, it could easily become offensive to someone. Mm-hmm. So it it could possibly wear raise more awareness because it definitely kind of opened my eyes more. You know, it doesn't, this kind of stuff doesn't really happen in America, thankfully. I mean, like, it does, but it's it not. It does like, a lot. But definitely when you do think abroad, it's, oh my goodness, it's in some parts, it's like, almost like, oh, it's like, come on, Amazon, let's say now. It's, right. And it's horrible. Yeah, it is. How about you, Alec? It's, um, it's definitely made me more aware of, like, signs and stuff of like hey this is the start of a setup this is the start of something that can be set up like <clears throat> when you're like if you're driving around and like you see signs that's like need work call this number yes like yes. that like with no other information whatsoever just to need work call a number that is like signs of this is not okay this is a very dangerous situation at like best case scenario it's a really shady job that it may not just it may not be sex trafficking, but like you still shouldn't do it because it's just super shady and, pro- and possibly illegal. And at worst, it's a setup. So right. like and yeah, photo shoots. Come get your come yeah. get your photo yeah. taken. Yeah, and I not too long ago it was um, in November two thousand and seventeen. I met a friend of mine who's also an author for a weekend in Winchester, and she booked the hotel. And we get to this hotel, and we very quickly realize there's something really, really off about this hotel. It's very nice, but I think that I've been more aware of this just doing the research and writing this book, that there was, um, they were probably some sort of Slavic, I don't know if they were Czechoslovakian, 
they weren't Polish, but, you know, I knew that they, and two guys who were stationed at the entrance, two guys stationed at the elevator. It was like, you could just tell it was a setup. And so when, when, um, my friend Robin and I got off the elevator, you know how when you're taking a, a picture of someone and, or taking a picture of yourself and you hold your phone up? Well, these two guys were taking pictures, but the, the angle that they were holding their phone, they were obviously taking pictures of us and not of themselves. So we, we both felt very uneasy to the point we both felt like we were going to puke. We talked to the manager about it. We kind of think he was in on it because... <laughs> It's, it's it was like, like really, walk, yeah. Like, so we like, and oh, just walks in. You know what? Never mind. <laughs> we yeah, we ended up changing hotels, and it was just like, this. This book is definitely if you want to. You know, most of this this kind of stuff happens because dudes and girls don't really you know know you know. And it's definitely mm-hmm. this book is definitely a starting point to say. This happens. We don't want this to happen to you. Exactly. It's 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 a turning wheel, starting the car on a way to say, if this ever happens to you, this is the steps you take. You do not, you like quoting my mother, do not go past go. Yeah, do not, right. Do not collect two hundred. That's a monopoly line. <laughs> Well, and I do. In the book, there is a section where I give all of those things like don't do this and, you know, just things that you need to be aware of because you need to be aware of things like that. You know, if your family's traveling and you get to a hotel and you notice that there are guys stationed in the foyer and there's guys stationed at the elevator and they're watching you walk to your room and they're still there when you come out and they're there every time you get off the elevator, then... You know, warning, warning, Will Robinson. And in that case, you pull out your switchblade and <laughs> you hold it like this. Just hold it against your leg, not showing it. Walk, walk calmly to the nearest cell phone, call 911, report this. And if they try to stop you, you use that switchblade. Well, and you have to be really careful because when you are doing the reporting, which is one of the things that my friend and I talked about, was we were going to call the human trafficking hotline and not the local police. Because often, unfortunately, if there's a setup in a town like that... Then they have someone stationed inside the police office, yes. too. Yes. Go along yes. With it. It's almost like one of those thrillers you watch on TV, you know. And that's how we felt that night. We felt like we were stuck in some sort of crime movie or something and you couldn't escape. <laughs> to quote something kind of obscure, it's like the first Scooby-Doo movie when they're trapped on the island and they're reporting, hey, something's going on here to the Coast Guard, but the Coast Guard officers are in on it, so they don't do anything right. about yes. it. Yes. That's exa- and that's exactly how we felt because at one point we had walked out of the hotel to walk across the street and eat dinner and there was a guy in the shadows, just like standing in the shadows, smoking a cigarette. And he said, where are you going? That's none of your like, business. <laughs> uh, to grab some socks and from then, the dollar store down the street. And it was the hotel manager. Oh, no. Which made it even <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> Finding a whetstone to sharpen my blade. You want to come? <laughs> <laughs> want to come watch? Right. <laughs> Okay, so... A fun thing is to seem crazier than the people trying to hurt you. (laughs) Right. And I think that maybe we're answering the next question, which is, would you describe this book as a thriller? I see this more of an action book. There are indeed some suspenseful moments where it makes you, like, kind of hold your breath or, like, sit on the edge of your seat reading it. But I find this more of an action book because there are more action-oriented moments in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah that make it more, like, action-focused than maybe, like, you're you're not necessarily scared, per se, but you are, like, waiting in suspense. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I would say that, too. Definitely more of a kind of an action, but there is some definite thriller moments where you're, like, in suspense, and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? Like, when she was meeting up, trying to go undercover Mm -hmm. to the... Please, and she meets up with the main villain for like, I think it was like hot seconds. cocoa, hot chocolate. Oh, the yeah. entire time I was sitting there. <gasps> Just like. It's <laughs> 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 so not hyperventilating, but. I mean, I am. Go for it. 
And these are the times when I first read the first copy of the book uh, that they're messaging me. Wait, what are you doing? What? What is this? What's this? What's what this? Happened? There's white things I in the like, air. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they just like wakes up in a basement and I'm like... Well, you did this to yourself. I was like, is she fine? Is she fine? Is she fine? Well, she, she's not okay. <laughs> she's in a basement. I imagine she's not okay. She's not okay. She's... Yeah. <laughs> You just spoiled everything, Becca. No, she didn't. No, shut up. <laughs> that's, like what, that's what's called a teaser. She's now dead. Gonna be she's like, actually... What happened next? She's actually in purgatory. So what happened next? So that's... No, don't tell me. I'm just saying that's what she... Well, said. what happens next is purgatory. <laughs> she wakes up, sees Dante Alighieri and Virgil, the poet... And they have to climb. She has to climb the mountain with them. It's really, it's really weird crossover with Dante's Purgatorio and the, and. Okay, final. if you haven't figured this out yet, Alec likes to joke around a lot. No, I'm being completely serious. I'm being completely serious. Just read Dante's Purgatorio. You'll notice that there is this one unnamed character that follows them seemingly throughout the entire book. See, Kathleen went back in time. In, <laughs> Put that thought in Dante's head. Hey, write about this one girl walking with you. And then went back forward in time and rewrote it. So see, all, right. all of it is just time travel. But, but <laughs> elaborate in, time in a travel. way, it's true because there are only so many themes in literature. And so every time you pick up a book, you're reading one of the original themes in literature. It's just written a different way. Yeah. So, okay. So Pro would tip. you recommend this book to other teens and why? I would definitely recommend it to teens who are, like, older ages, like... Definitely older ages. 15, maybe 15, uh, but definitely, like, 16 up. Like, don't... Like, if you're going to buy this as a gift for a teen that you know, or, like, in, like give this to a kid to read and stuff like that, don't make it, like, 14, 13, because I don't believe this will be necessarily a book that sparks their interest so much, plus, as this is a more adult topic... That, yeah, it needs talked about so they have a general awareness of signs to watch out for. But, like, don't scare them. Yeah, you don't want to scare this, them to death. This is definitely death. more of... I would say this is definitely more of a book towards girls my age. Because at that... You know, around 16 through... Who Life. Knows, girls definitely want to, like, hey, I want to go see this guy. I want to go out this date. And right. there, that's where it mostly happens. Right. You meet to meet up with someone, you know nothing about them, they're getting real personal, they're wanting information. Next thing you know, you're in a trunk of a car. Or a so basement. Right. Or a basement. <laughs> right. You thought you were drinking hot cocoa with your new boyfriend and you're in a basement. <laughs> it, it's it's definitely more of a book to say, um, I would love you I no. I would like you to read this to maybe start thinking, start right. start, maybe, start the conversation. Start the conversation. Right. It's, you know, it's, again, it's not really a conversation you want to have, but it's a conversation you need to have. Exactly. Right. And so that's one of the reasons I wrote it. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I wrote it as a novel instead of just, if I would have written a handbook and said, here's a handbook for, to avoid. Here's a handbook. Here's, here's a handbook. Yeah, here's a handbook. How many of you would read this? I wouldn't. I'd, right. I no would offense, read. Kathleen. Right. I real, I know that it's yours, but I'd probably be like, yeah, I'll read it, and then give it to my mom. I was like, you read this. I don't you care. You read this, right. So, but then when I, hand it, when I hand you a novel, and it's got a plot, and like you said, it's mm-hmm. suspenseful. You're at, at the end of every chapter, there's a cliffhanger, and you want to know what's going to happen next. I'm more inclined to read it than say... Signs to watch out for human trafficking. One, don't answer random ads on the street. (laughs) Two, make sure you are aware of your surroundings at all time. Three, if you see someone who who looks like they're taking a photo of you because they're trying to pull it off as they're taking a selfie, they're probably not taking a selfie. Writing these down. Keep going. Four, (laughs) don't go outside. Ever. Stay in your home. The outside world's dangerous. Mother knows best. Listen to your mother. On your own, you won't survive. Number one, we'll round five. Yes. Thir- the third world, honey, please, don't trust your third wheel. Bring a fourth, a fifth. You know those, you know those tanks that have almost ten wheels on each side? Honey, why stop out there? Bring the clan. Bring the troop. Bring the colony. <laughs> Everywhere you go, bring an entire army of people. If you don't, you will die. Are we talking about war or human trafficking? I don't your know. Sword. We kind of you moved to another territory. That bring I'm your sword. Control. Bring your horses. Bring your knights. Bring your bishops. Are we talking about chess now? Yeah. Rooks. There you go. 
<laughs> okay. Definitely let's, bring the bitch up. Be the king of your own board game. <laughs> let's talk about one more person before we wrap this up. Let's talk about Cecilia. What was her role and what was her character <clears throat> like? You know that one character you introduce when you're reading? Not really a bad novel, but the char- the main character, It's she's without flaw. She is flawless. <laughs> she got she got Which is a flaw inside control. of itself. She has life planned out, and then in reality, ah! again, it's it's like sculpting something out of ice, putting it there, admiring it in the hot sun. <laughs> yes, and she melts, doesn't she? To sum it up succinctly, Cecilia is a very, very bubbly, obnoxious, annoying, I'm better than you character. Who you later sympathize with, maybe, possibly, depending on who you are as a person. But in the beginning, you might hate her guts. Oh, I know I did. In the beginning, I was like, <laughs> in the really? Be- <laughs> I, like, right at like, the beginning. Like, Wear the sweater. this sweater. This one is a better fit for your eye color and your hair. I'm just like, please stop talking. <laughs> I sure really like, don't care. does not look good on Reddit. So I was like, you know He's what? He's like, you know it, what? It may not be necessarily complimentary, <laughs> but, you know, you look at my sister Sarah's wear. I'm like, it may not match. She may be wearing black polka dots. I hope your sister time. listens to this, honestly. But, you know, she, she wants to wear it. She better wear it, and she's gonna look good in it. Your opinion does not matter. If you so got what it, is, flaunt it. What is really cracking me up about this is that you guys are railing on this person that I created out of nothing. <laughs> because we despise her. <laughs> for the most it's, part. It's always, it's always, you know, kind of cool. It's like, you know, you're like, Oh my word! I hate this character. If, they're like, and they're like, is this a person of my fate? Then I'm at If you can, if you, if someone has created a character that you can talk about as if they you knew them personally, you've done well. Well, thank you. Then, <laughs> then I have achieved my goal. I could talk yeah. about Cecilia as if she was a real person I knew who bothered me constantly, who plagued me at work or at church or something, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, did you see what Cecilia said? Oh my goodness. <laughs> like, she told me to wear flats. Did you see what, did yeah. you see what she, did you see what she, uh, she like made a really passive aggressive post on Facebook about so and so, oh my gosh, I can't believe she had the nerve to do that. I can't believe that day she told you to wear a bow tie instead of an actual tie. Like, yeah, doesn't she know I only wow. wear suspenders, wow. gosh. Okay, so let's just say that these two do not like Cecilia, but somebody physically describe her. You skip that part. So what does Cecilia look like? <laughs> She's the perfect child. She's blonde, blue-eyed. She has a... Uh, you described her as having a nice figure, right? Like, yes. pleasing to the eyes. Yes. Endless penny bank. Target yes. of... Men's affection. Yep. And you know, you're walking down the street and you see that one girl or dude. You see that one like, person who you question. Like, what have I, what am I doing wrong? What, what has. Almost. It's, it's like, it's like looking at a model. Like, how is her nose, her freckles, her, you know, moles on the side of her face completely look elegant and me, I look like I just crawled out of the garbage can. <laughs> I was very right, out of hell, but okay. So we are going to wrap this up, and I'm oh, going to have fun. each of you tell me your favorite part of the book without giving away the ending. Ooh. Uh, I like the part where um, she's going, you know, it's going on an adventure, going starting this plan to go find her friend and she's worried that this will affect her future like it's like that moment where you like put on your big girl boots yeah to think differently she the entire time she's like i don't want to lie to my possible future family this is supposed to be my family it's it's like ruining your one good chance to be able to have something you never had. I am not and throwing away my shot. <laughs> what? I am not throwing away my shot. <laughs> I'm young as right. hungry. Well, and I like how you said that. You know, it's time for her to put on her big girl boots, and so there was definitely a change. And there definitely was a um what do you call it, a guilt. It wasn't just, you know when you read those one books and the character's like, 
throwing this away and it's like, but I don't care. It's my dream. It's what I want to do. You mean me? I, it's like, you. And then now we're older and we're like, you idiot. Watch, it's like watching Ariel. She's like, Daddy, I'm 16. And I can do what I want. Like, You're 16. You are a child. Okay. Calm down. <laughs> you are still a little kid. Sweet, honey. You know nothing. You're throwing away the whole kingdom because that guy is good looking. This will end in like a week. You met him Thursday night. It's barely Friday morning. He it's saved your life? Time. That's called Nightingale Syndrome, sweet. <laughs> okay, Alec, what was your favorite part? <laughs> uh, my favorite part was definitely like the flashback scenes um, where a character that you didn't have before the revision, uh, the flashback scenes with her and the professor. Yes. Because uh, yes. I, re- I really, really enjoyed the character of the professor a lot. I wish okay. there was more. Can't play. I wish there was more scenes with yeah. the professor. Wait, oh, wait, 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 wait. <coughs> I can't change the first book. I can bring him into the second book. You well, can... now the second book's finished. Kathleen! <laughs> <laughs> can we? Can I tell them? Because like that's not. You can su- tell them something. Yeah, sure. He's dead before the book even starts. <laughs> <laughs> See, I you did, get, did you get like a paragraph, a paragraph of the man. You you get a bunch of sentences like, oh, this man did this. Like, he was a very loving person towards. Uh, Adelina. And Kathleen ripped him from her. No, he was in his 80s. Kathleen ripped him from her. <laughs> he was in his 80s. You could have made him younger. Like in his no, 90s, I, I couldn't make him younger because of his connection to her had to do with his experience during World War II. So what I'm hearing is this is the mentor stereotype when you have to create an adventure novel where it's the mentor stereotype where in the first few chapters they have to die. Yes. Got it. Yes. The disappointing part. <laughs> More but, like I did the same thing. But the, the amazing thing about the professor, and he is in interspersed a little bit into the second book, Defining Family, but he actually, although he died before the book began, and there's a lot of flashbacks with him, he stays with her because he's the one who taught her the coping skills that she needed just to survive yeah. life in general. And he is the one who gave her the what? The dictionary. Oh. It's not the book of poems. That yeah, was a that different. Was, well, that was way different. Yeah, that, that was, was not the professor. Different. That was not the professor that at all. And we professor. won't tell that story because it's a t- funny story. In that's the book. not a funny story. That is an upsetting story. Well, that gives her some gumption. So, so yeah, the professor's in there, and he has experiences during World War II, and I really actually drew from real, real life. I did a lot of research and um, used the book Hiding to Survive, which is just a book about children who survived World War II by hiding at different places, chicken coops, family homes in the basement, in the attic. And Mm. I also brought in the true story of the Zabenskis who ran the zoo in Warsaw that was bombed by the Nazis and they actually hid a lot of people in the zoo after it was bombed. So I tied that in. So I tied that history in. So um, thank you guys so much for joining me and thank you for being on my revision team and my future revision teams. We'll just get that agreement right now, right? I'm too busy for that. Sorry. Uh, Alex trying to get out of it. Back is the revision team. Bye guys. See you later. (laughs) What made you? <laughs> I'm glad that you guys would that you came on and that you enjoyed reading my book and that you would recommend it. So, thanks for joining us on the whole house. See you next time. Bye. Bye bye. We're so glad you could join us here for the Whole House podcast. Please subscribe, and if you give us a review, we might pick our favorite and send you a prize. Please remember to like the Whole House Facebook page. And follow us on Instagram at the underscore whole underscore house. And please, please sign up with your email on our website, thewholehouse.org, to be notified when new things are happening here at The Whole House. Thanks so much for listening.